so that's really the problem. We have completely changed the nutritional integrity of our food, assuming that weight is all that matters. And as a consequence, we have really created, opened this Pandora's box of uh, diseases, self-induced human diseases, diseases that are no longer associated with bad bugs, organisms and stuff like that. But these are biochemical disruptions to our own physiology, our own health, you know, the car cancers, the diabetes, the cardiac problems, the autoimmune problems, the list goes, attention deficit, the list goes on, the massive exponential increase in self-induced preventable diseases that we have induced through our food. And that is growing up exponentially, 6 to 8% per year, and within the next 20 years will completely collapse all medical systems in the advanced world. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock. You just heard from Australian soil and climate scientist, Walter Yenna. We shared part one of our interview with Walter last week, a conversation focused on soil science and climate issues. Today, we're diving into farming and nutrition with Walter. We are so grateful to have Walter as a member of our advisory board, and you can visit our website, realorganicproject.org, to learn more about the many inspiring board members that we have helped guiding our efforts. And they span the fields uh, from farmers to chefs to scientists and celebrated authors. Now let's get back to the conversation between my co-director, Dave Chapman, and Walter Yenna. I want to I go to nutrition right now. Yep. And the, and the relationship between a soil carbon sponge and nutrition. Okay, so, David. Yep, yeah, it's a, and, and then we'll relate that. How is that nutrition connected to health? So, but, yep. yeah. Very important. Uh as we discussed earlier, you see, it's when we create that soil carbon sponge, you know, the organic matter intermixed with that mineral detritus to create the voids, the spaces, the sponge, you know, that makes that open, beautiful organic soil, that sponge. And by creating actually the exposed surfaces on those mineral particles, we enable the microbes, those 10 billion microbes, to solubilize, access, take up, and bring those nutrients into life, right? Rather than being locked up in a rock, unavailable, we can actually increase the availability just by increasing the surface area exposure and solubilization of those nutrients. By having that biological activity in the soil, the 10 billion little bugs working, we can also, of course, vastly increase the cycling of those nutrients. Okay, and so if you think we have just say one one unit of nutrient, one molecule of nutrient, the productivity depends not on how many molecules we've got, but how efficiently and rapidly they're cycled. Because if I can cycle that one molecule of phosphorus a thousand times faster, in a healthy organic system than in an inert mineral, dead mineral system, I've got a thousand times the productivity. I've got a thousand times the productivity with the same quantity of nutrients. So the biofertility of soils isn't a moron strategy. You know, we've always got to add more on, more on, more on. It's actually how do we increase the life of our soils to increase the fixation, solubilization, access, uptake, cycling of these essential nutrients. Okay, so the whole biofertility in nature and the biofertility in natural farming system isn't a moron strategy as industrial agriculture. It's a strategy of increasing availability, cycling, and sustained use of those existing soil-based nutrients. And it's profound because basically we can have, as I said, 
well, hypothetically a thousand, certainly the, the nutrients in a rainforest, even on very poor mineral soils, are cycling hundreds of times faster than they are on exactly the same soil if we remove that rainforest, if we kill those bugs and just try to grow agriculture on that soil. And of course, that's been the experience so, so often where we go into a forest, think it's productive land, clear it, and within two, three years after all the bugs have died, we're back to basically an arid wasteland saying it's got no fertility or it's lost its fertility, yes, because we've killed the cycling and then we're basically left with moron strategies putting nutrients on that we mine and exploit from elsewhere. Okay, so that's the first part of this whole question of soils, the organic soils and nutrition in terms of productivity of agriculture, productivity of biosystems. But something is much, much more important as far as this whole nutrition soil story. And this comes back to really fundamentals of life again, going back when we were life was first evolving 3.8 billion years ago. You see, life is simply biochemistry. And basically, there's a whole lot of chemical compounds that, in a sense, constitute life. But the organization and the processes of life depend largely on enzymes. You know, these are really little catalysts that drive the processes of biochemical life. And these enzymes are made up of protein molecules, but these protein molecules mostly have a mineral cofactor, a very, very trace small amount of mineral, and that actually is fundamental for that protein, for that enzyme to be functioning. So if we've got chlorophyll, you know, like fixing green plant matter, we've got a magnesium molecule that we need to make a chlorophyll molecule. If we, as humans or as animals, we need blood to transport our oxygen, what have you, and we've got a, uh, a hemato- um, we've got a basically a heme molecule, but it needs iron as its essential nutrient. And so life... We, we need a whole range of essential mineral nutrients and we need them in the right forms, concentrations, ratios and balances for healthy biochemical life. There's about 96 natural elements in the solar system to our knowledge. Well, that's all we've got. And life, biology, uses about 80 of them but perhaps 50 plus, and we haven't got all the knowledge here, are actually essential for healthy life. And so to have health, it really is a function of have we got these nutrients that we need for our biochemistry in the right forms, concentrations, ratios, and balances. It's that simple. Linus Pauling, again, 50 years ago, four Nobel Prizes, Yes, this is the fundamentals of preventative health is the mineral nutrition and this biochemistry that we depend on. Now, the question then is, where do we get these nutrients from? And all through evolution, we've got them through these fungi, through these microbes, through these soil systems, because it's these fungi and the microbes through their membranes have been selectively actively taking up nutrients from surfaces, have been excluding toxic elements to make sure that they get the right nutrients they need for their, in the right forms, concentration, ratios, and balances. And of course, transplanting, transporting some of those nutrients to plants. So the plants have the right nutrients. And of course, we have just evolved on those plants eating those plants, and we depend on those nutrients in the right forms, concentration, ratios, and balances. So in a sense, we depend on this microbial, selective, intelligent, active uptake and exclusion of nutrients from the dead mineral soil mix. Okay, it's a quality control system of nutrient uptake that then governs 
it's the fungal biochemistry, the plant's biochemistry, our biochemistry, and our health. And all through basically civilization and life, effectively up to the Second World War, we actually relied on that natural, organic, microbial nutrient uptake. But after the Second World War, we fundamentally changed things because we now harnessed, obviously, fossil fuel energy. We had all the sophisticated chemistry and we had actually this drive to say we need to grow more food. And we evolved an industrial agriculture that was dependent on a moron strategy. Okay, we can mine minerals, we can create artificial fertilizers, we can put artificial fertilizers on, and never mind if they then leach into the rivers and pollute the streams and eutrophy systems downstairs. So we were in this extractive mineral thing. But by putting on all these fertilizer nutrients, by cultivating the soils, by using massive quantities of biocides, you know, the insecticides, fungicides, weedicides that we use in dust, we have basically killed that whole microbial ecology in these soils. Okay, so all those quality control systems that used to govern how we got our essential nutrients in our plants, in our food, we've destroyed those. They're operating at less than 1% of natural activity in industrial agricultural systems. And instead of that, basically industrial agriculture now relies on effectively hydroponics. What are the nutrients available in the soil solution of these chemical farmed soils? And basically, how do plants take those nutrients up and of course, they're the nutrients that the pl our plants now have. Now, the thing about nutrients, most of them are positively charged, most of the essential trace elements, and so they're absorbed onto soil surfaces with negative charges, and they're not in the soil solution. You know, they have to be taken up from surfaces. And so in our industrial hydroponics, we are now very much dependent on soluble nutrients in the soil solution. And sure, there's, you know, the fertilizer nutrients that we add, which are soluble, the nitrates, the phosphates, but so are the sodiums and the potassiums, and so is the aluminium. And in acid conditions, the cadmium, the mercury. And so we end up with a completely different soup of soluble nutrients going into our industrial food plants. More seriously, they often have very, very low levels or none of the essential 30, 50 trace elements that natural plants used to take up from soil surfaces. So we have fundamentally changed the nutritional integrity and concentration in our industrial food plants. And the UK Ministry of Health, USDA, CSIRO, where I work, we've confirmed that our industrial food often now contains about a third of the nutrient concentration that it did pre-World War II, and often none of those essential 30-plus trace elements we need for our healthy biochemistry. So we have fundamentally corrupted those food nutritional integrity sources. Yes, we can still provide high yields of starch and sugars and you know, empty calories. And so our food now is, yeah, it's got bulk, it's got weight, but it hasn't got the integrity and the concentration of nutrients we need. So we may need to eat three times more starch, starchy food, to try to get the nutrients that our body needs. And that's a big part of the whole obesity, diabetics, you know, crisis that we're facing. And so that's really the problem. We have completely changed the nutritional integrity of our food, assuming that weight is all that matters. And 
as a consequence, we have really created, opened this Pandora's box of uh, diseases, self-induced human diseases, diseases that are no longer associated with bad bugs, organisms, and stuff like that, but these are biochemical disruptions to our own physiology, our own health, you know, the car cancers, the diabetes, the cardiac problems, the autoimmune problems, the list goes, attention deficit, the list goes on, the massive exponential increase in self-induced preventable diseases that we have induced through our food. And that is growing up exponentially, 6 to 8% per year, and within the next 20 years will completely collapse all medical systems in the advanced world. So you make it sound like there's a science experiment going on and we are the lab rats. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, well, more than the lab rats. No, no, yes. Well, I mean, uh, yes, we, well, we have knowingly, and this comes back to, I suppose, Al Gore's point, we have valued yield and returns and profits and efficiency and simplicity and protection rackets, right, and vested interests and have corrupted that nutritional integrity and basically, and we're now talking people in our advanced countries, inverted commas, our food is so corrupted, our nutrition is so corrupted, we are seeing this exponential spike. And, and basically the association is absolute, you know, like here's our nutritional decline and here's our disease increase. But also it's biochemically, you know, I guess there's plenty of specific diseases where we can say, yes, we don't have selenium. Therefore, we don't have perioxidases. If we don't have perioxidases, we can't kill cancer cells in our own physiology. Guess what? We've got an explosion of cancer. It's yeah. a bit more complicated than that, of course, in the biochemistry. But that's the simple message association. And so, yeah, we, we've done that. And so we're more than, I suppose, the lab rats. Um, we're past that stage. We are now, yeah, we're now hemorrhaging in a massive global disease industry that's very profitable, but of course it's killing people in a very significant way. So um, a friend of mine, a guy that I got to know in a workshop, and he's just a guy, a working guy, and, and it, it really hadn't occurred to him to eat organic food until he uh, met me, and we started to talk about it. And, you know, he started with, basically, he's a value shopper. He's looking for price, right? He's got a budget. He's not broke, he, but he's not rich. He's just a, a working guy, and so when he goes to the store, he's looking for price. He's looking for a good deal. And I think that this is a little bit of the Faustian bargain that we have been offered. So can you talk about, talk to my friend and talk in the simplest way you can about why he might want to rethink that strategy? Well, I, I'd be better than that. I, I, I'll reinforce his strategy. Yes, you want, to, you want to be a value shopper. Yes, you've got to be rational. Now look at the cost. Look at the health cost. Look at the health externalities. Look at the consequences and put that into the same value equation that you're dealing with. So don't change your values, but just look at all the factors rather than just the commodity cost on the shelf. And now when you factor in the health cost and your health cost, and why are you working, why are you living, why are you rearing children, where do you want your future to be, put those costs and the consequences of that food onto those into that balance sheet, and yeah, you make a very wise value decision and it's a thousand to one that you'll go into natural, healthy, high nutritional integrity food. Simple. Yeah. See, and so that's the trouble. We've been completely perverted in the messages. It's definitely a misinformation. We are just getting sold 5% of the story, you know, in terms of costing because... I mean, come on, you're in the U.S., you've got a farm bill. There's near close to basically $100 billion of subsidies, right? Sorry, no, a trillion dollars. Sorry, I apologize. A trillion dollars of subsidy, close to. Okay, reinforcing, protecting 
that industrial food system. Yeah. yeah. And so we've just been, yeah, misinformed. And of course, driving that, oh, that, that will then drive this disease industry, which is again, um, a mo monstrously big. Yeah. The, the, you know, they're very good at marketing. Um, one of the, one of the slogans of the, of the hydroponic producers who are being certified as organic is making organic uh, affordable for everybody. And because they, they can produce hydroponic vegetables cheaper and hydroponic berries cheaper than the people who are doing that job, working with the life in the soil and cultivating this whole complex ecosystem. So you're suggesting that, first of all, that that's not organic and that it's not really making it affordable for everyone. It's and just, it's not cheaper. It's not cheaper because, as, as, you, cheaper. as we just said, look, it's a, there's a trillion dollars of farm <laughs> taxpayer subsidies subsidizing that system, perverting the valid price. I mean, come on, this is 1776. It's the American independence. It's Adam Smith. You know, like, and basically the price has to reflect the value, doesn't it? And if you pervert the price, you completely change all the values. And that's what's happened. We've basically subsidized external, I mean, subsidized the current status quo. We've externalized all the health disease consequence inputs, and we've completely perverted that message to the public. And um, yeah, that's, it's just, and again, okay, so we're not going to, win it by arguing with the government or that vested interest there. It's a case of saying, no, your health matters. You are empowered to look after your own health. So hang on, when are you going to start growing and buying food that has got nutritional integrity where you know that it's been grown in a system that has that nutritional integrity, i.e. it's grown on a soil in an organic system? And so you hope, basically you vote every time you spend your dollar. And so the question is your food dollar has to go for integrity, not cheapness in an artificial market. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. I want to jump back just for one other thing that, that hydroponic producers say to me. I, I talk to a lot of hydroponic producers, some are my friends. And... Um, Oh, heavens, I just had one this week, uh, a nice man, call me and say that um, hydroponic production is uh, more sustainable than organic production in the soil. And I think he was referring to um, that Nature article that said that organic production was unsustainable because it had lower yields per acre, so it took more acres. So... Uh, it, it, it must be unsustainable because it, it was replacing um, maybe rainforest with organic farming. And it struck me that, first of all, they were including in organic farming things like CAFOs. Yeah. And uh, could you just for a minute, well, I'd like to come back to that, but just for a minute, let's talk about CAFOs, C-A-F-O, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. They now how 99% of the meat, milk, and eggs in America produced in conventional. Yep. And now in organic, in certified organic, they have colonized the organic label and are rapidly taking the, they already have taken the leading role in poultry and eggs. And I think they've probably crossed 50% in milk. So, and I know that CAFOs have been accused of being one of the most destructive uh, forces for, towards the climate. Could yeah. you talk about, about why that would be? Well, look, yeah, and clearly, I mean, it's, it's just an extension of this whole industrial model. Okay, we've taken an animal, but really, as we've been talking about, it's a question of what are you feeding that animal on? What is the environment that animal is growing up in? And if you're in a CAFO and now you're feeding it on, you know, industrially grown maize and soybean, mush, you know, that basically hasn't got nutritional integrity, then there's no way that that animal has got nutritional integrity and there's no way that the food it's producing has got in nutritional integrity. So you're just kidding yourself, right? So the, basically the milk, the meat, the eggs from those systems can't have that 
integrity because the supply, I mean, the input is already adulterated. And so, see, we're actually just, again, taking out one system. Oh, I've, I've got milk. It still looks white. Well, look, it's just white liquid, right? It's not milk because milk is basically a, a whole grass with all that wonderful nutritional integrity that a cow has digested, has put through its rumen, has basically taken out those nutrients and makes then milk. But you've got a completely different setup. So, so first of all, the CAFOs are completely misinformation, missing out on those values of integrity. So it's no longer food. It's just industrial chemical. Secondly, the CAFO, because it's a linear system, yeah, they depended on extracting inputs, mining inputs from elsewhere, using them, and then massively pollution, polluting environments downstream and wasting those excreted nutrients. And so, again, if all those costs, both in mining and pollution, and all those externalities were looked at, then CAFOs are nowhere near as productive as a natural ecological system. It's just our false accounting of those CAFOs. So both from a nutritional health integrity point of view, they're a disaster, but also if you look at their full embodied cost and externalities, they're an economic disaster. And again, they're just a, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just a tragedy and of course, they're trying to exploit and greenwash, overtake, trying to take up labels to, as a marketing guys to keep on selling more of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And in a sense, the answer is very simple to say is, right, I understand that. And I'm not going to buy that material because it's worthless. And you yeah, yeah. vote with your dollars to say, no, I am buying food of, with integrity. You, we were going to talk about um, the difference. We're talking about methane, and, and cows have gotten quite a reputation as being uh, damaging to the atmosphere, to the climate, because of their methane production. I've heard you give a fairly eloquent description of the difference of what happens to that methane, whether the cow is in a confinement operation or out on a pasture. Could, yeah. you, could you go into that a little? Look, uh, uh, yes, I mean, it's very a big story. It's quite sophisticated, but uh, let's just keep it simple. Basically, animals, uh, especially animals with anaerobic biodigestion systems, but we all, all of us, we produce methane because that's just a byproduct of digesting carbon in these gut systems, right? And there's no question that herbivores with rumens particularly, they naturally produce methane, both as belching and out of their rear ends. And of course, the question really is, right, yes, there's a product in nature, methane, but everything is balanced, isn't it? Like, is there another reaction in nature which removes that methane? And is that balance stable and is it causing a problem? So everything, any chemical, every chemical in the world is toxic or dangerous in excess or absence, right? By definition. And it's always a balanced reaction that matters. And so we've got to ask the question, well, okay, what's the problem with methane? Now, if you go back before industrial agriculture or before actually we dominated, humans dominated the world, we had literally billions of herbivores grazing grassland producing methane right because they all had guts producing methane and the methane concentration in the planet's air was about 700 parts per billion traces right so there wasn't a methane problem because basically there are other processes in those natural herbivore grassland ecologies to break down that methane and just recycle it. And of course, that's basically the grasslands that the cows are maintaining. They, of course, transpire water into the air. When you get basically solar radiation interacting with those water vapor molecules, some of them will dissociate, oxidize, and produce basically hydroxyl radicals. These are 
you know, basically very active radicals. And these radicals will rapidly oxidize any methane. And it's this balanced process that kept basically methane at 70, 700 parts per billion globally. So here was a natural processes. Yes, cows on pastures produce methane, but also the pastures are producing these hydroxyl radicals through natural processes, which can basically oxidize about 100 times the methane that those cows on those pastures are producing. And we've got a stable system. And of course, methane just doesn't come from cows. It comes from rice paddies, from wetlands. There's a whole lot of other natural sources. But it's these hydroxyl radicals in the air naturally basically broke down all this methane and everything was stable. Okay. So if you, so if you, if you, if you have the cows living in association with the food that they eat, then the problem is balanced. But if you put the cows in confinement centers right. and on, on deserts, basically, and, you know, and, and grow the food elsewhere and bring it to okay. them to eat, to, to, absolutely. you have a problem. So, that's the whole point. So we have a system which is completely balanced and natural and buffered and actually doing an enormous beneficial service because, as I said, these grasses, the, the hydroxyl radicals that they're producing, they're also cleaning up all the methane that's coming out, as I said, from wetlands, from paddies, from tundras, from volcanoes. Okay, And they're really the Earth's insurance policy against methane you know, concentrating in the atmosphere because that's very dangerous. So it's more than just the methane from the cows. They're actually running the planetary methane cleanup system. Now, you're absolutely right. Once you put, I mean, I don't know, forget the word you use, but once you put these cattle in a concentration camp on concrete and feed them this rubbish, and especially if you feed them grain, which the rumen wasn't designed to digest, you know, these can animals were de designed to digest grasses, not starch. They will produce prodigious quantities of methane. But of course, there's no photo oxidation coming from those concrete pads that they're living in. And there's no photo oxidation from the effluent ponds that basically, again, releasing all the methane. So you have created a system that generates methane and deleterious factors, both in growing the feed the uh, maintenance of the animal, and of course, the management of the effluent. It's all just a negative methane uh, situation without any photo oxidation inbuilt. So under no circumstances are we excusing or we mixing CAFO animals with natural grass-fed animals. They're chalk and cheese, two different systems. Do you believe that um, livestock raised uh in a natural pasture situation are a necessary part of regenerative agriculture? Oh, look, this is so, so critical. I mentioned in the earlier part of the discussion that we have created 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland covering some 40% of the ice-free land on this planet. And grasslands are absolutely essential because they're the things that have got a capacity seasonally, whether it's dry or cold, to colonize into those arid areas. So our only capacity to re-green and re-vegetate these degraded, harsh, seasonal, cold, dry environments are grasses. But grasses can't function without their synergence, the herbivores, the animals, because grasses, if they're just as a grass, as a plant, they'll grow, but then they become moribund and they'll just burn back to CO2 and desert. And so the only way the grasses function ecologically, they're very sophisticated, is in combination with their herbivore symbionts. Okay, so grasses and herbivores, herbivores go together as an integrated system. And so really it's the ecological management of these grazing ecologies, you know, using grasses and herbivores in intelligent combinations that allow us to regenerate deserts and wastelands. 
And so, yeah, absolutely. And so it's these holistic and wise ecological management systems. Sure, we can overgraze them and degrade them, but not having herbivores de- dictates that those grasslands will just grow, become moribund, fuel, wildfires, and back to deserts. Okay, okay. So uh, an, my next question has to do with uh, a water use issue. And um, one of the things I hear quite a lot is that hydroponic production is necessary because in a world with dwindling water supplies, we need to conserve our water. And a hydroponic producer uses, they always claim, you know, a small fraction of the water that a field producer will use. It, you know, they call it using or wasting. So I'm, I'm curious uh, how you would respond to that, Walter. Look, uh, again, it's tragic because, yes, people are, are talking about an efficiency uh, on using water in a confined system rather than, again, building the context, taking it wider and looking at the whole hydrology as we've talked about before. 71% of this planet is covered with water to a depth of about average depth of 4,000 meters. That's the oceans. Okay, there's still vast quantities of water in the landscape, you know, in lakes and rivers and what have you. And there's again vast quantities, 5%, up to 5% of the air is water as water vapor anytime. So we've got rivers of water going around the earth, over all the world's deserts, continually in the air. So the issue isn't water. I mean, we're not, we haven't lost any water significantly on this planet for the last 4.2 billion years. It's not water shortages. It's how do we manage these hydrological cycles. Now, we've talked early on about, look, it's all about regenerating the earth's soil carbon sponge, because if we do that, we infiltrate that water, we can store it in our in-soil reservoirs, those soil layers, you know, as we say in your prairies, up to 10 metres deep, that are acting as an in-soil reservoir, protecting that water from evaporation, making it available where and when needed, okay, from that soil, and that's what roots are doing all the time, okay, getting it for free. And so there's abundant water available as long as we are wise to say, look, we rebuild our soils, we rebuild these in-soil reservoirs, we rebuild our wetlands, we recharge our springs, we recharge our aquifers. There's any amount of water and what more, it helps alleviate the sea level rises that we're otherwise going to get because we're going to store more fresh water on land for longer rather than letting it all run off immediately into the sea. And so here we are now, people in hydroponics saying, hang on, if I've got a a tank of water, yes, I can use it a little bit more efficiently, you know, like hydroponically. But in a sense, what they're doing, they're sort of saying, okay, uh, yes, in that small context, but I'm saying we can regenerate the bigger context and give you 100 times more water, giving you endless safe water supplies as nature does through regenerating these bigger context soils, in-soil reservoirs, hydrological cycles. So beautiful. So the answer is it's it's you know like water you I mean like if a plant transpires water through its leaves it's not a wasted amount of water. I mean that that transpiration is actually cooling the surface so it's doing a function. It then goes into the air, it gets nucleated and comes back as rain. So that's a very positive function. So we've just got to look at this natural water cycle and its benefit, 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 benefit as we go through the cycle. And so we've just got to see it in that context rather than just saying, hang on, I've got a thousand gallons in a tank and I can grow 10% more plants if I have hydroponics. As long as we have the soil carbon sponge to catch that rain when it falls. Uh, When Lindley was driving to inspect our farms, the Real Organic Project Farms in California, 
She said, you could always tell when you were coming to one because you've been driving through two, two hours of brown and you suddenly came to a green, absolutely. A green farm. Yeah. No, no, look, look, so, absolutely. And if you go to, say, Central Valley, California, and you go back 300, 400 years ago, it was absolutely a verdant garden of Eden, wetlands, you know, the Sierra Nevada snowpack. I mean, the whole thing was this exquisite hydrological uh, basin and green and luxuriant. And look at it now. And it's not due to hydroponics that's going to save us. It's rebuilding all those natural hydrological cycles, which starts with regenerating the earth's soil carbon sponge, in soil reservoirs, protected shelter woods, and green plant cover. Yeah. All right. So my last question here, um, you once said to me uh, basically that it's 72 hours between us and total social chaos. And that would be if the food system broke down and the, and the energy grid, that the, the systems we rely on for our life that we really take for granted, uh, that if they were disrupted for 72 hours, it, it, it would be a, a madhouse. And yeah. so I think that to confront the, the things that we see really are crises that are upon us and to try and build the kind of complexity and stability that you're talking about, that's, that's what the Real Organic Project is trying to do in its own small and very humble way. And I'm just curious, um, I think that, you know, people listening are going to go, well, how can I affect the Earth's soil carbon sponge? So how do we approach this as a movement? Okay, look, it's very important. And, and the quote comes from actually the Arab Spring. And yeah, the message, very simply, but totally reaffirmed, was that it's, yeah, seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. Now, whether you can stretch it beyond 72 hours, possibly, but it's seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. And that holds. You know, we need air every three minutes, we're dead. We need water three days, food three weeks, but basically seven missed meals. You know, the message is clear. And of course, as we've been talking about, one of the key things isn't yield or more, more, more. It is actually ba balancing and resilience and buffering in our systems that matter, right? Because as we're facing increased hydrological climate extremes, food extremes, social extremes, and of course now pandemic extremes, it's actually the resilience and buffering of systems that is being tested and found wanting. And so the message is very simply, how do we reinforce that resilience, that buffering? And we can do that by relocalizing our essential supply chains. Okay, so are we reliant on food in a globalized system that's being imported from all over the planet and have to arrive just in time in our supermarket? Or have we got local, organic, productive systems in our own you know, habitat that we can rely on because that's resilience, that's buffering? There's 7.8 billion of us on the planet, 10 billion by 2050. 70% of those people will be living in these urban concentration camps we call cities. And the issue becomes very critical, as you say, well, how do these, you know, 8 billion people in these concentrations, what is it that they can do to empower themselves to be more resilient, autonomous, buffered? And the answer is, the only thing they've got is, yes, uh, regenerative agriculture, urban agriculture, rebuilding, yeah, those food systems at that local situation. Again, it's the cities that are the sink for all the nutrients that all the farming land, all the farming product is bringing into the cities as food. Those cities risk, and throughout history, that's been the lesson, they risk collapsing if they don't manage the excrement from those nutrients wisely, you know, that's where you get your cholera and typhus and all the disease crises happening. But if we are wise, we can recycle all those nutrients back 
into urban agriculture, into very healthy, productive, localized, organic food systems. And so this becomes actually an enormous opportunity because then the answer is, yes, how do we relocalize food production, you know, healthy, nutritious, green vegetables? How do we reestablish urban forest, cooling, shading, protecting urban forest? Of course, we're still going to be integrating agriculture, for example, grain production, uh, animal production in a wider hinterland. But how much of our food and nutrition and nutritional integrity can we empower to create locally? Can we actually create local distribution systems, fair, just value systems? You know, the farmers markets, the community cafes, the total local empowerment of these food systems. And of course, the answer is yes, we can. And where we've done that, it's extremely beneficial both economically but more importantly ecologically but also from our human health and from our social resilience and buffering to avoid those seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. Psychologically it's, it's extremely valuable and beautiful because it empowers people to say yeah you're not just a victim you're not just responsible, but you are also responsible. You have agency. It's as simple as regenerating the Earth's soil carbon sponge. Let's end on that uh, wonderfully positive note. Thank you so much, Walter Yenna, um, for talking with me tonight or this morning for you. Um, it's always a pleasure. And thank you very much, David, and, and wonderful. And let's hope we can contribute to this whole exciting opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 39. Please join us next time when our guest is Real Organic Farmer Jennifer Taylor, founder of Lola's Organic Farm in Georgia and a recent addition to the iPhone Board, which is the International Federation of Organic Movements. To find a Real Organic Farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farm.